So thank you guys for coming today. Um, I'm glad you're able to attend this. I have been recently, over the course of the summer, been working to get certified in helping people with systematic reviews. So this is really exciting for me too, because I can share some of the things that I've learned this year. And uh, for anybody who I've worked with in the past, I know a lot more than I did before. So um, I'm happy to work with you again. This will be um, exciting. So let's get started. So this is part of a series that we're going to be doing over the next month or so um, about um, the various parts of a systematic review. So today we're studying, you know, the various, uh, or sorry, studying what a systematic review is. And then um, for the next coming weeks in the series, we'll be talking about the different pieces of it and breaking it down a little bit further. So here you can see the dates. And at the end, I'll show these again so that um, you can kind of see. It'll probably make more sense at the end of the presentation. Um, but these sessions are probably going to run anywhere from like 20 to 30 minutes of content. And then I'm going to try to leave lots of time for Q&A so you guys can stick around and ask questions at the end if you need to. And if you can't make it to any of these, we are going to be recording all of them. So at some point in time, they'll be on our YouTube. And if you just uh, send me an email, I'm adding people's name to a list and I can um, send you an email when they're ready. Um, so please register for the other ones if you haven't. Liz, if you want to put that um, registration into the chat, um, register for the upcoming sessions, that'd be great. And so here's our agenda for today. So we're going to be going over um, what is a systematic review? Why do people do them? Um, some of the challenges. And then we're going to go through all the steps and talk about you know teams, the different considerations uh, you should take into you know, things you can, should take into consideration and Q&A at the very end. So let's start with um, why, or what is a systematic review? Um, this is a definition from the Cochrane Handbook, which are the, you know, the, the ultimate sort of authorities in, in systematic reviews. They're the ones who kind of, um, you know, really have made the methodology um, what it is today. So a systematic review attempts to collate all empirical evidence that fits pre-specified eligibility criteria in order to answer a specific research question. It uses explicit systematic methods that are selected with a view to minimizing bias, thus providing more reliable findings from which conclusions can be drawn and decisions made. So I've highlighted some of those pieces in there and that pieces that are in there are the most important parts for a systematic review. Um, they're different from other studies because you do have to have a plan in place before you start. You have to have everything specified before you even get started so that the team knows what you're going to be researching. You have to have a very specific research question in order to be able to get um, the results out that you need. And then you have to use explicit methods. You have to describe what you've done. You have to let other people know um, all the steps that you've gone through so that they can rerun the um, review if they want to. Um, and this, obviously, with bringing all these different studies together, it's going to help minimize bias because you're not um, filtering for different things. You're trying to accept all the literature and then only take out those that um, follow the criteria that you've agreed on from the beginning. So it can be complex. So getting started, um, it's really essential that you figure out, you know, what the process is like for a systematic review. So coming to this is a great way to get that started. There's a lot of pieces and um, quite honestly, so far, as I've been helping people with these, a lot of people get started and then realize that there's all these steps and then they kind of try to back engineer it. And that generally doesn't work very well. So it's just better to get um, really informed about what they are at the beginning so that you can start and go through the entire um, process in a way that's gonna make it easier for you. Cause these are time consuming uh, projects. And so you wanna make it as easy from start to finish um, as you possibly can. And Poorly done systematic reviews are really becoming more of an issue because, um, you know, they're really popular. People want to do them. So they're, you know, pumping them out. And a lot of journals are publishing them and not necessarily, you know, lo really looking through the methodology. And so we want to make sure that we're putting out the best possible content to get published, right? We don't want to be clogging up the literature with those poorly done studies. We want them to be reproducible and robust and all of that. So Let's talk about then why, um, why do people do systematic reviews? So there's a couple of reasons. Um, obviously, like we talked about, the synthesis of multiple findings is gonna help you to get a better idea of the actual um, effects or the actual intervention or how successful they are. Um, it's gonna reduce you know, bias in those ways because you are um, trying to take all the studies that are available into consideration. A lot of people like them because you don't have to involve the IRB. Um, the IRB is only, you know, when you're dealing with actual subjects. And because the point of these studies is, uh, the study of reviews, is studies and not participants, you don't have to involve the IRB. So that, you know, removes one step. And of course, there's a prestige, you know, associated with publishing systematic reviews, having one of those attached to your professional name, um, because they are the gold standard articles, um, especially in evidence-based medicine. 
So this next slide here, you've seen, I'm sure the evidence pyramid, um, but this top part then of course is where you, you know, where we we're getting the best evidence. And so that's that filtered information. And, you know, in any of these charts, they show you that the bias goes down as you go up the pyramid. So as you get to the top of this meta-analysis, which I am not going to be covering, um, I'm going to be stopping at systematic reviews. Meta-analysis is just basically a systematic review where they've compiled all of the statistics and then run statistical analysis on all those. So it's another level of, um, you know, uh, ways of getting, uh, you know, more pinpointed information. But Systematic reviews, as far as uh, like literature reviews, are the top because you know you're you're getting less bias because you're including all these studies, and it's you know it's really useful for um, evidence based medicine. So let's talk about some of the challenges now. Um, and I already mentioned the first one. Uh, often people you know get really excited about the process. They want to jump in. They start looking for articles. They start you know looking at things before they're even ready. So having an idea of the process and the commitments um, that you're going to need to, you know, commit to to have a well done systematic review, it's, uh, you know, it's important to know all that before you get started. Also, these projects can and should take like 12 to 18 months or more. They're, uh, they're long term projects. So you have to make sure you have a team of people who are committed can, um, you know, stick it out through that. So, you know, you get the entire process done and then can move on to publication. And then of course, complexity. These are just complex um, projects. They have a lot of parts and you need to do a lot of documentation. So those you know, are some of the challenges, but um, you know, if you start at the beginning, it, you, there's ways to make that all easier. Okay. So I like this image. Um, some articles you'll see kind of break these up into different steps, but um, this is a, an image from um, an open learning initiative through Carnegie Mellon. And I liked uh, Campbell collaboration. And I liked this image because it kind of shows, you know, um, how this works. So we have our seven steps that we'll go through in a minute. Um, this is the logical, um, you know, path that you would take. So ideally you work through these steps, but this other arrow kind of shows you that there's going to be feedback and you're going to be working through these steps. Also, you're not going to be just moving in one direction. You may find something out and need to come back and retool it. So, um, the steps in this, you know, it, it, it is iterative, but um, that gives you a good idea of what you're going to be getting involved in. And we'll kind of talk through all that, too. Um, the number one step, and we'll be covering this in another session, is to get your team together and you want to develop what's called a protocol. Um, and the protocol is essentially your plan that you agree on before you even begin the research. So like I said, I'll be going into this a lot more um, in another uh, session where we'll talk about you know documenting and all that stuff but essentially what you need to know is you need to get together and you need to come up with um the plan for step one to to get yourself set before you do this so the steps in this then oops, is um first of all your team has to come up with a clear and answerable question it needs to be very clear and it can't have multiple facets. It needs to be, you know, very focused so that when you do your literature search, you can put all those pieces in and get, you know, a very sensitive search that's going to give you the results that are um, relevant to what you want to study. If you add too many things in, it can really get complicated. And that's when scope creep, I have to say beware of scope creep. Uh, it can be a real challenge because as you start finding things, you might get excited about, you know, a direction, but you always need to kind of pull yourself back. And that's where this plan comes in place. Because if you start to do that, you can bring yourself back to the protocol and say, nope, this was our question. We're going to be focusing on this. Um, these questions are often laid out. And for those of you in healthcare, you'll know this um, using the PICO format. Um, there are other others that you can use as well. Um, but the PICO format is um, you're taking, you know, your research question and bringing it down into population, intervention, comparison, and outcome. And that's how you can sort of phrase your research question. And that PICO one is particularly good for systematic reviews. Spider, Spice, and Eclipse, those are other ones that are out there. Um, they may be better for um, different disciplines, like if you're in the social sciences or education, or if you're doing mixed methods reviews. So again, we'll kind of go through these, but just be aware there's, there's different ways to, um, to frame your questions so you get to what you need. Okay, and then along with that predefined question that you're gonna determine um, as a team, the most the other important part, I think, of the uh, protocol is defining your inclusion criteria and your exclusion criteria. So these need to be really explicit. 
um, because what this is going to do is this is going to allow not only the librarian to, um, to search more effectively, but also when you've laid these out, when you go to start evaluating the articles that you find through this process, you will know based on your criteria um, which articles um, you're going to potentially keep moving forward to analysis and which ones you can throw out because they do not include the criteria you need. So the inclusion criteria are the traits that the articles will have. So if you have like four inclusion criteria, any articles that are gonna be part of that final product need to have all four of those inclusion criteria. And then exclusion criteria would be anything that if it's present that you would, you would not wanna use those. Um, so they would be eliminated prior to analysis. So in the write-up process of this, um, inclusions, um, they're essential projects and you have to have them you know, set up, but the exclusions really, um, are going to be important because they have to be carefully applied and you really have to make a case for why you use them when you write your final product um, because they can introduce bias into your results, right? If you say, um, I only want uh, studies that are in English, you know, that is potentially something that you would want to do because you don't have translation services available. But if that topic is being studied in another country, in another language, you're going to be missing all the evidence from that. So you need to say in your final paper, we didn't include non-English papers because we didn't have a translator, whatever that is. Um, even then though, a lot of times they do want you, you know, there's translation services available, but you know, as we get into those um, pieces later on, we can kind of talk through a little bit more, but just having those laid out, it's gonna help you when you're trying to reach agreement, when you're screening. And also, you know, it's just gonna help when you um, go to write the final paper, it's gonna give you that framework. Oops. Ah. Okay, so number two then, I skipped ahead a little bit too early, sorry. Um, number two is searching the literature. And so once you have your protocol in place, you're gonna talk to a librarian and you'll come up with a sample search and then you'll kind of you know, get that uh, more perfected by working, again, iter iteratively with the information professional. But the journals, when you publish these, they require um, the search is to be reproducible. That way, if somebody reads the article and they wanna try to reproduce your study, they can go into the same databases do the exact same search, and hopefully they'll get the same results if you've done, you know, the same number of results if you've, you know, described your process well. So librarians um, are an informationist in Ann Arbor um, at Taubman Library. They're called informationists. Um, we are really essential in this piece because we know the databases. We can, you know, help you with which databases are appropriate, the, you know, controlled language, um, translating between databases because they use different syntax. Um, librarians can do all of that um, for you. So. If you're planning on doing one of these, please reach out and I can you know, help you with that. So the next step, step three, is gonna be screening studies for eligibility. So once you have um, gotten your search done, the librarian has retrieved the articles that match that search, they you know, pulled them all out. What we'll do is we'll deduplicate those because if you're searching multiple databases, you will get duplicates. We'll kick those out and then the researchers will get to those um, titles and abstracts and they'll read through all of those first. And so they will screen based on just titles and abstracts to see if they meet um, if the inclusion criteria. And if there's any exclusion criteria, they would get eliminated at this point in time. So obviously, you know, with this stage, there's gonna be a lot that'll probably get kicked out. And then you'll re relook at what you have. And then anything that's made it through that stage of the process, you're going to retrieve them full text. And the librarian can help with that as well. You can retrieve them full text. And then the um, researchers will read them and screen them to see if they should make it to the final, um, the final analysis. So these are like two steps before you even get to the analysis piece. And um, the readers are gonna read independently so that they're not influencing each other's decisions. And then there should be, um, and we'll talk about this later too, there should be a third person who can act as a tiebreaker. So if you, you know, have a disagreement between the two readers and they decide that they want to, um, they, they can't decide which, you know, which way to go. A third person will come in and resolve that. And that will be that person's role. So step four um, is data extraction, coding, and a critical appraisal. So now you've gotten your articles, you've gotten your full text articles, you've decided on the final articles that you want to include in your analysis for the paper. You're going to start extracting that data, um, you know, and coding things, however um, you decide to do that. Um, the researchers will pick a critical appraisal tool, and there's lots available. Um, I can also help with that, um, finding a 
critical appraisal tool to analyze each study um, and then to compile the data. And then step five, um, data analysis and synthesis. So this is where you start writing the paper and actually looking at the findings and what you've discovered from, um, from everything, putting it all together. And then step six is um, the reporting and dissemination. So you're going to write it up, you're going to submit it to a journal, um, and you know that's that's pretty much the end of this part of the process. Um, I do have a note on here. You do want to kind of carefully research journals before you um, you know submit them because depending on the type of review you're doing, and next week we'll get into other kinds of re reviews besides systematic. Some journals accept scoping reviews, for example. Some don't. Um, some don't do any reviews, so you want to make sure a journal, if you're interested in it, actually publishes the kind of reviews you're looking or you're, you're producing. Um, and again, finding journals is another thing librarians can help you with. So if you want to get with me, we can kind of explore what journals are out there. Um, and that's another thing that is very good to know. Um, step seven, then. This is not necessarily part of it, but... Um, if there have been changes in the topic that you've produced your systematic review, or if you, there's another systematic review that you know has reproducible uh, descriptions, um, it may be a good idea to rerun that review because things have changed, right? And you want to update it. So doing that um, is really good practice, especially like I said, if 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 you know there's been a big change in evidence-based practice, that literature should get out there so people know the old way isn't um, how people are doing things anymore. Okay, and now we're going to jump on to kind of what a systematic review team should look like. So um, Cochrane, who um, I talked about before, Cochrane recommends the following team structure as an ideal minimum. Um, and sometimes there is overlap in these roles, and I'll talk about that in the next slide too, but there should be two clinical experts. So these are the people who you know, know about the topic that's being studied, can read the articles and understand the um, underlying you know, disciplinary information behind it. There should be a statistician, um, especially, well, you know, if you're doing a meta-analysis, you need to have a statistician. It may not be as necessary. You may just want to have a methodologist if you're not doing a meta-analysis. That's just somebody who's familiar with this um, systematic review process. Um, there should be a librarian involved for that um, literature search piece of it and all the documentation, you know, around that. And then ideally, there should be a healthcare consumer or stakeholder. So somebody who would be using these, um, you know, these treatments or somebody who would be um, potentially providing the services that you know are under study. And uh, a little notice here on the side, all team members should be free of conflict of interest. So they will ask that when you um, supply your article. And it's um, a lot of times, you know, if it's a real conflict of interest, you may not be able to be part of the team. This is the most common sort of team structure that I've seen. And again, there, there can be overlap. So you'll definitely have two clinical experts. They're going to, be, going to be the ones who are screening all the articles that come in. And then there's going to be that tiebreaker. And that tiebreaker can be a clinical expert or it can be somebody who's at least familiar with um, the topic. So it could be a librarian. It could be a consumer. Um, it could be, as I said, they can kind of overlap. But we'll kind of talk about this in a little bit more depth here. Okay, so the clinical experts, I kind of already, already talked about this. They're going to be the ones who are going to um, do the eligibility screening extract the data and actually, you know, write the findings part of the paper. And then that third reviewer is going to be involved, involved to, um, uh, to be a tiebreaker. So the statistician um, or methodologist, like I said, if you're doing a meta-analysis, you would want a statistician, otherwise a methodologist. Um, they can bring experience as to, you know, what a systematic review is like, what the process, you know, how the methodology goes and all those, um, all those pieces of it. So, when it comes to regular systematic reviews, so far I've been acting as a methodologist with the ones I've been working on because the search piece of it, when you're just doing a, a um, systematic review, pretty much is the methodology. And then finally, um, oh, sorry, not finally, uh, second to the last, a librarian or information specialist, um, they have the expertise for creating those searches and making sure they're reproducible so that when you submit it to the journal, um, all those requirements will be well done. And then again, a healthcare consumer stakeholder and these can absolutely be um, you know, parts of the team who are involved in that field. So reporting, um, as we said at the very beginning, so as you write these articles, you have to report basically every stage of what you're doing. You have to keep records and you have to be explicit. 
So one of the main strengths of doing a systematic review is the fact that they should be reproducible, ideally, right? If you've written up all of the methodology properly, somebody should be able to go in, redo your search, get the same articles, and um, have that methodology uh, work again. So the documentation is essential, and storing all that documentation um, is, is important. So some of you may have heard of this, and we'll be going over this again in another session, but utilizing a PRISMA, um, which stands for the Preferred Reporting Items for Systematic Reviews and Meta-Analysis Checklist and Flowchart, um, they used to be optional, and they were just good things to use, but now they've pretty much become a requirement for most publications. So they're really helpful, and I think it's, you know, I think it's great that they're being required because it really does help to make it more systematic, and then the researchers are going through the, the same steps, you know, as everybody else and including the same pieces. So uh, the Prisma, the checklist, that's going to help you to kind of make sure that you're hitting all those pieces. And then the flow chart, if you've read a systematic review or some sort of other review, you may have seen them as a flow chart where you start with, you know, how many articles we retrieved at the top. And then as you went through each step, how many were eliminated till you get to the bottom, how many were um, available for full text analysis. And I'm sure you've seen those in, in various presentations. Okay, so systematic review resources. Um, I'm going to get into resources, specific resources in the following um, sessions, but I did want to give you just some, just some general info. So right now, the Campbell Collaborative is offering a free systematic review workshop, um, and it's it's under trial, essentially. So if you agree to be a participant, it's like being a participant in a study, but you can go through this free systematic review workshop. It's like eight modules. And it takes you all the way through meta-analysis too, which is nice because um, a lot of a lot of different training modules don't um, address the meta-analysis part. So I recommend if you're really interested in a, a good, you know, it, it you know it takes a bunch of hours, but it is a, a good um, option. And then the National Institutes of Health also has this page, which I think, and I'll be sharing these slides with you all. Don't worry. Um, but there's a page uh, with links to various informational resources and tools, which you know can be really really handy. And then, yeah, attend the other webinars in the series because um, we'll be going through the different resources. And again, in those presentations, I'll link out to those resources. And there's just so much out there for systematic reviews. It's it's really been um, amazing the last few years just to see how it's how it's ramped up in the training and everything. So um, that essentially is the end of the presentation for today. I want to go over this again just to kind of show you. So we did this today. Um, the next week, I will be talking about other types of reviews. We'll be talking about scoping reviews, reviews of reviews, those kinds of things. Um, join us for that. And then uh, three, four, and five will be breaking up the whole process into three different steps. So talking more about that preparation piece with the research question, protocols, um, the, the literature searching, and Prisma documentation for that piece of it. And then finally, bringing it all together, all the quality assessment, evaluation, documentation, and the data management that's involved with these projects. So it's going to be a lot, but it's going to be really good. And like I said, we'll be recording these as well. So um, now I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, yes, if anybody has any I questions, I'd be happy to answer it. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. So the I know the systematic review, but the um, you now certified that, right? So the what step on the systematic review you can involve to help us to do the literature review? So I can meet after... Um, the team, let me kind of go back here and I can kind of show you um, based on the steps. I'll we'll go, oops, I'm in the wrong one. Things open here. Back here. Oh, there it is. Uh, so, really, I can help with the one and two. Mm. And then um, the, the reporting piece of it. So, I can help when you guys, you know, when a team has those first few pieces put together where they know the, you know, essentially the research question and what kinds of articles they would want. Um, teams can meet with me then. Then we'll start going over what we might potentially search the databases to include those sorts of things. Um, and then we'll go back and forth. I'll search the literature and then do the citation extraction, um, which I would then hand over to the team. And then they would move on to um, step three. But, the, you know, if 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 um, anybody wanted to include me in their project, I can also help writing the methodology piece of it. So those are the pieces, right? Does that answer your question? Yes. Also, the, maybe you want to identify the keyword to represent the. Yes. And that, that, that I'll definitely get into that in the protocol um, oh, review, like like the, more explicitly, because you do uh -huh, want to have keywords uh -huh. and all those sorts of. But the, the two main parts is that we need to be, at, be able to search the literature and to um, 
know what kinds of articles that we're going to be including um, to get that protocol okay. rolling. I'm going to maybe uh, attend in the following session, but I just want to know uh, and to manage these information. So there are a lot of abstract after you do it. How, what the software, how do they manage these information in and out this stuff? Do they use some website or do, typically I use the EndNote for me, but the, uh, do they update what the best way to do it as a, as a multiple team member to involve? It's it's funny because I have talked with lots and lots of librarians who do this, and there really is no best tool. It's kind uh -huh. of one of those deals. There's free tools, there's paid tools, there's but everybody has a different um mm. different preference. So EndNote is great, Ray, but then there's also some um uh things like RAN, which is a systematic review software. Oh. And again, I'll get into these when we get into yeah, that. Yeah. So I'll, there I'll, I'll show, but okay. there's all sorts of software that's out there for screening, for analysis, for letting the team work together, you know, doing blind reviewing. Oh. There are all sorts of cool things. So yeah. Anybody else have any questions? While you guys are still thinking, this is my info. So feel free to email me. Um okay, well I really appreciate everybody coming today. And um like I said Feel free to get a hold of me if you just have a question you want to check in. Um, I'm happy to help with any aspect of these. Um, and if, if I can't help you, I'm able to point you in the direction of somebody who can. Thank you for watching this recorded webinar from the University of Michigan Flint Thompson Library. Find more webinars and registration links at libcal.umflint.edu.